thanks a lot for the introduction. So I hope I unmuted everything I had to unmute. Otherwise, someone will probably start to <laughs> complain very soon. OK, seems like I everything is fine. OK, then I will, just for your information, switch over to a different window so I won't see the chat at the moment. So if you ask any questions in the chat, um, we will come back to that at the end of the session. <clears throat> All right. Essential architectural thinking. What we will do now in the next 45 minutes, I think, is we will talk about the why, which from my perspective is the most important question. We will talk about the what. We will not talk about the how so much today because that would require a lot more time than 45 minutes. And we will wrap up with talking a bit about the when and the how much. So that's what I try to cover. My name is already said, Uwe Friedrichsen. Um, never try to pronounce that if you're not coming from Germany or a country which has a similar odd language as we have anyway. And if you want to download the, uh, just for this slide, if you want to download the slides later on, um, you can go to my speaker deck account and there you will find the slide deck and some more stuff. All right, but now let's get started. Why do we need architectural work? I mean, that's, I think that's a very important question because um, the bad thing that I always see is before we stop asking why and regarding architectural work, I think we stopped asking why we're doing that about 40 years ago. And if we stop asking why, that has some strange effects. For instance, here with architectural work, you see very different things that somehow do not fit together. Like you see all these people who talk about agile architecture or emergent architecture, often together with this death to all the architects because Scrum does not know an architect role and all that stuff. So these developer-centric architecture, hey, we just do our TDD loops, red, green refactor, and architecture will automatically emerge in some way and so on. On the other hand, we see then the leftovers from the 90s, the BDAF architects who say, yeah, um, do not touch the keyboard, do not start writing any line of code before I have added the last line on the last diagram I have to set up up front, which doesn't match. We also see kinds of stack overflow architectures. I've got a problem where I need more than 10 lines to, of code and two minutes of thinking, so let's go to stack overflow, see if there's a library that I can include or framework and yeah, works on my machine and upload it. or often in conjunction with um, hype-driven architecture or conference-driven architecture where, oh, yeah, doesn't anybody, isn't everybody doing it this way right now? And therefore, I also have to do it this way. Um, does it fit your situation? Yeah, well, we don't know, but we also don't care. Or we have this strategic architects. So, I mean, if you haven't touched a keyboard in seven years in... IT in an IT department, you either get promoted to manager or to an enterprise architect role. Um, and so if all manager roles are all currently occupied, you become an enterprise architect. And then you say you're doing strategic architecture, which doesn't have to do a lot with the other things. And I mean, strategic often, be, often being a different word for, um, I do some stuff that nobody else cares about, um, but well, that's the bad part. So we also have that fire accelerant, that architect is a step on the company career ladder. So junior developer, senior developer, architect, manager. I never understood um, what these th different roles have to do with each other because it's very different skill sets. So you can be an excellent developer, but you can be a poor uh, architect. You can be an excellent architect and be a poor developer. And some people are both, but um, that's not the majority, I think. And, 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 and. So strange things happen. And that's because we didn't ask why. So you have all types of things. Uh, you ask three people, what is architectural work about? And you get seven opinions or more. And... How do we try to tackle that problem? Well, usually we tend to discuss then what architecture is instead of asking us why we need it or how at least how to work on it. 
Uh, I mean, I've seen websites uh, with the title, Why Architecture? And then there was a long description. This is what architecture is, and therefore we need it. Oh, because this is it, we need it. So it's like, yeah, well, this is running, so you can sprint, you can long distance, you can go for medals, you can just jog in the afternoon. And because this is running, you must run. Oh, do I need to? Um, I mean, we're not all Forrest Gump, so do we really need to run? But that's the kind of discussion that I usually see then. Or it's about the important things. Yeah, maybe it is about the important things or the things that are hard to change, but what are they and why? And so I'm not really happy with that. And I think the biggest problem is that we forgot to ask why. We need to ask why to focus our work. Without asking why we're doing something, the value of our work will always be accidental. That's not only true for architectural work, that's true in most situations. If we forget to ask why, we just do something and we will never know if it really adds value or not. I mean, that's why you come into many bigger corporations and they seem so dysfunctional because people are just doing stuff because they're told to do it, but they were never told why it's important that they're doing it. Ask them if you're in a company next time. Okay, then let's try to answer that why question. Let's try to reestablish focus a little bit. Why do we need architecture? And if you ask me, I usually start with a slight smile and say, well, we need architecture and architectural work to establish the architecture, to address an optimization over time with changing constraints. And well, if I say that, the typical reaction is then this one, which is perfectly fine, I admit. So let me unpack that very cryptic statement a little bit. If we talk about architecture, usually architecture, at least if done right, tries to satisfy quality attributes. So you try to figure, so if you go to any reasonable architecture training, people will tell you, try to start with the quality attributes. Use them to drive your architectural decisions to find the structural and behavioral principles which lay the foundation for your architecture, which in turn then drives the design and implementation of your solution. And there are a lot of these quality attributes. Here are some of them. So there's also, there's not the right set of attributes. There are lots of them available. Some of them are sorted in some standards, but, um, it's not that um, there's just, here are the 12 ones or the 20 ones, and these are the quality attributes and everything else. Not so, so it's a little bit floating and depending on your context, some will be more relevant for you and some will be less relevant for you. And you also know quality attributes, one of the names of illities or non-functional requirements. And while the last term, even if widespread, is a little bit debatable, I think, because, for instance, functionality is a non-functional requirement. Well, uh, really? Well, security, I mean, security is all about functionality in some way, and um, still it's a non-functional requirement. So this, this term is a little bit, I would say, at least tricky, so I rather stick to quality attributes. I think that's a little bit better to use. And if you look at all these quality attributes, then you can see, if you look closely and think about them for a moment, that you can segment them in two general classes, development related attributes and runtime related attributes, including usage and operations related attributes. Some people try to split them up in three classes, which is then development, usage and operations, but for the sake of this, uh, um, of this presentation, it's okay. 
if we just say development and runtime related attributes. The interesting thing here is that I've seen heated debates of people because one person talked about development related attributes and the other person talked about runtime related quality attributes. So let's look at them for a moment. Development related attributes. Let's start with them. They describe the desired behavior of a system from a development build and test perspective. So they influence how efficiently you can modify a system. So they target the cost of change of a system, basically. So maintainability, changeability, understandability of the code, the system structure, and so on. There's a caveat with these development-related attributes because the effectiveness of the measures you take can usually only be measured in hindsight. So let's assume that you have two options that you could implement and you have to pick and basically to figure out which one is actually the better one, at least if it goes, um, uh, how it contributes to maintainability or changeability and these things. So the development related attributes, you would need to split your timeline in two timelines and then implement all future changes until the end of lifetime on the system, add up the efforts and then see which one was better, which decision, going the right way or the left way. So, and while it's a little bit tricky to split up timeline into two timelines, unless we are some Marvel superheroes or somebody, uh, someone like that, which maybe we are superheroes, but not the Marvel type. So we don't live in multiverse probably, or at least we haven't detected that. Um, that's a little bit of a problem. And so, yeah, well, we are sort of doing some arcane guesswork and we all know that subject of many heated debates. You have to do it this way, otherwise maintainability will suffer, will it? We don't know because uh, we only know in our context and it depends on the future changes that we still have to apply. So maybe it really will suffer or maybe it doesn't affect us at all or maybe it's even the better decision for our type of system. We so it's still a little, it will always be a little bit of guesswork. We have some heuristics, what helps, what doesn't help, but we will never really know. But the key point here is that's the optimization problem. So we try to optimize our cost of change over the time, over the lifetime of the system. Runtime related attributes are quite a different story. Runtime related attributes, they describe the desired behavior of the system from a usage and operations perspective. So they are more about correctness. Are we still in our boundaries or are we outside of them? So they constrain the solution options and help us evaluating different options if they work or not. So let's assume we have a um, response time requirement, which says, well, our solution should respond in 300 milliseconds in 99% of all situations. So 99% percentile. And then you have one option here, solution option here, which you could implement, which in average responds in 500 milliseconds. Well, it's out. So probably we have to pick a different option. So this way, they support us in evaluating options and it's more about correctness. Are they in or are they out basically? So in our solution space or outside the solution space. One thing we need to note is that also these things can change over time. So maybe our solution started with just internal users and then over time it's opened up for customers and then availability or scalability or response time behavior and so on may dramatically change then, um, at least significantly change for the solution and may force us to find other solution options for that one. So that's the changing constraints. If we go back to that image here, then we see, okay, over here, these are the development related attributes. And here we see the runtime related attributes. Well, and so we have the separation over. We know um, here, optimize cost of change while not violating runtime related quality attributes. Hmm. And we're almost set with that, <coughs> with the why. 
but there's one thing missing, which unfortunately isn't covered by the quality attributes. That is, cost of change is not sufficient as an optimization goal, as it neglects all other types of costs that might be relevant. So for instance, we had a situation in a project once where there was a discussion, should we add an interactive help system? So which highlights changes in your system and then immediately gives you interactive help, not, not just simple help pages, but something which really helps users. It's not very easy to implement that and just to take some easy to remember numbers. Implementing the basics for that would have been 100,000 euros. And then there were three, uh, two releases per year and implementing all the help for the new features and changed features would have been around 50,000 euros per, um, per release. So first year, 200,000 euros and the upcoming years, 100,000 euros cost of change, added complexity, and so on. So just looking at that from the cost of change perspective, we're saying, yeah, well, um, let's stick with the um, with the simple help pages, and that's it, because it's more complex, it costs more money, and so on. And yeah, it also maintainability, understandability is worse, because it's harder to understand the code. And yeah, let's get rid of that. Um, but if you look at the bigger picture, you see, well, they had to train, as was an application for their internal employees in the stores, uh, around 2,000 of them. And they always, when they released a new version of that system, they had to train the employees for a whole day. So training them with all the changes and so on. And a whole day of an employee not being in the store cost them, let's also simplify the numbers a little bit, but the relation is correct, um, 500 euros. And 2,000 employees, 500 euros is a million euros per training, what it cost them. So two trainings per year, 2 million euros. So if you just look at cost of change, you would have said, no, let's not do that. If you look at the overall picture, you say, well, that's a good decision to do that. So that's why it's important to look also at the other types of costs that your decisions inflict, like not only deployment, co uh, development costs, but also deployment, operations costs, maintenance costs, license costs, infrastructure usage, administration, cost of people, maybe even lost revenue if you miss a window of opportunity and so on. So there's a lot of things to talk about. So the optimization goal therefore must go or must target the cum cumulative costs instead and not only the cost of change, but as I said, usually not covered by the quality attributes. With that, we can, can, come, we can come back to my cryptic statement. Why do we need architecture and architectural work to establish this architecture? Well, with architecture, we try to attempt to minimize the cumulative costs of a system over its lifetime while ensuring that the runtime related properties are not violated, that the system behaves correct at runtime from usage and operations point of view. That's why I think we need architectural work to make those two things sure. I have one more complementing thought about the why before we move on to the what. If you look at that definition, cost optimization, making sure that attributes are implemented correctly at runtime so that it behaves correctly at runtime, it all reads a bit technocratic. And I once saw a documentation about Ilse Crawford. She's a quite famous interior designer. And there was a sentence that she said that really struck. She said, ultimately, design is a tool to enhance our humanity. And I thought about that for a while. Though. Well, I think that's also true for architecture and architectural work. Because, for instance, if we improve maintainability of changeability of a system, it improves the lives of developers and of people from the business departments because they don't have to 
wait that long for changes and so on. If we're able to um, improve availability of a system, we improve the lives of our administrators, and operators of the system. We also improve the lives of the users of the system because they usually don't have to wait for the system to respond or that they always get an answer whenever they need it and, 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 and. So in the end, I think if we're doing architectural work right, we help to improve the lives of the people affected. And we can use that, I think, or we should use that to augment that other definition that I gave before optimizing costs over lifetime while not violating the uh, runtime constraints. Because sometimes we have different options to pick from and we always should look, is it good for the people? Because we think about people too, or, or humans too rarely in our job, I think. And I think it's a good idea to do that. So that's what I wanted to add to the why. Okay, coming to the what, now that we know why we're doing it. So what should we do? There's a lot of things that we could do. But before we look into the what, into a very tiny framework to arrange the core activities, let's first introduce what I call the first two laws of architectural work. The first law is that Every decision has its price. No decision is for free, which means that all our decisions have not only upsides, but also downsides. We see so many people run around these days saying, yeah, I do that and everything will be fine. And you ask them, are there any downsides? No, 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 no. Everything's great. Everything's great with that solution. There are no downsides at all, <clears throat> which, sorry, is horseshit. Um, there are always downsides to any solution, nothing is for free. So it just depends. I mean, that's what architectural work is about, to see what are the upsides and the downsides and then find the solutions which give you more upsides than downsides. It's not a black or white, it's, it's grayscale, basically, what we're working with in architectural work. So there, there is no perfect solution. There are only better or worse solutions. And to figure out, what is better or worse, we have to look at the second law, which is a decision can only be evaluated with respect to its given context. So decisions are never invariable good or bad, but only in a given context. I mean, I just recently heard a talk where someone began with the words, we all know monoliths are bad. And my first thought was, no, they are not. So it's crap, basically. I mean, it's possible that they're bad in your context, but they can also be the best idea that you could have in your context. So it really depends on the given context. In some situations, monoliths are a great idea. In other situations, they're a very bad idea. So, <clears throat> but you have to evaluate that in your context. And we also see a lot of people who run around and say, this is always better than that. Is it? It never is. It depends on your context. So look at your context, then evaluate. I see so many violations of these two laws that I wanted to present them first before moving on to this little model of what we need to do. So when we think about what we need to do, there are many options what we can do. And I try just to arrange it into four core groups. So what I did, I created a 4E model of architectural work. It's, it's a very, very tiny model. I mean, Simon Brown, who will 
talk later or today or tomorrow here also on the conference. He has this really nice C4 model and that's a cool name and I wanted to come up with something similar. And so I played around with words until I found four words with E. And now I have a 4E model, which I like. Um, it's better than uh, CD, KX, whatever model or something like that. And I would like to introduce that model alongside a typical discussion that I have once in a while when I discuss architectural work with some people, with other people. <clears throat> and so if I ask other people, yeah, what is architectural work about then? The first thing they always come up with is, it's about explorer, it's about finding and describing solution options. So usually, so these any solution options, so structures, behaviors, combining frameworks, tools, technologies, and so on. Usually they're not talking about options, they're about talking about designing the solution in that context. So there's only one in their head usually. So we describe the architecture, right? Yeah, right, that's an absolutely important activity. I mean, we always do that either explicitly or implicitly. And if we do that explicitly in some way, it increases the probability a lot that we end up where we want to be in the end. Um, if we do it implicitly, well, chances are that we drift away to some very different places. Problem is only if this is everything that you think that architectural work is about. If you reduce architectural work to explore activities, to describing this architecture. So because right now you have that architecture here, this design, and then, um, yeah, um, going back to the why of things. So does it help to optimize cost over lifetime? I don't know. I have no clue. Does it make sure that the runtime related properties are all satisfied? I have no clue, I just have this architecture here. And so, well, that's then when I say, well, yeah, that's cool, that's great. Yeah, it definitely belongs to architecture work, but there's more to it. And people think about it for a moment and they say, oh, ah, yeah, it's this communication thing. I mean, architects always talk, don't they? So what I call, help stakeholders to make the best possible decisions. And I call it this way because quite often decisions are not made by architects, but by the other stakeholders. Architects only help them to understand all the different facets of the different options they have to support them in making the best decisions in their context. But Decisions are not made by the architects usually, but by the other stakeholders. So it's a lot about communication, collaboration, convincing and all that stuff. So these soft skills, which are very hard to acquire. And yeah, it's a very important activity too. And it's very important that you are able to collaborate with all different stakeholder groups. Um, so with all the people who are affected by the solution and you have to understand their needs, their points of views, their language, it's some, and what they're doing. And yeah, and don't forget devs and offsets, important stakeholder groups, because often I see two kinds of developers, developer centric um, architects who only look at developers and forget everybody else, including ops. And um, then I see the other types of architects um, who think about all stakeholder groups except developers and operations. So operations always forgotten and the other tools are mutually exclusive in some way. And yeah, we have to think about all of them because they're all important stakeholder groups. Um, but why that's true, we need this communication part um, it's still not okay for me. I think there's still something missing. I say then, yeah, well, that's that's great too, but still something missing. I think for a while, say, well, and say, ah, you always talk about this options and trade-off things. So it's about these trade-offs, isn't it? What you're missing. I say, yeah, yeah, that's true. That's identifying the trade-offs. So 
comparing solution options. I mean, that's quite often the first time when we talk about multiple options and not a single one and how the different quality attributes are satisfied and how it affects the overall costs over lifetime and so on and all this stuff. So, and this is also a very essential activity because now we can say, well, this solution option over here behaves this way in with respect to costs and runtime related attributes and so on. This is a different one. And so we have pros and cons, which we can compare then. So it also de delivers to the first law of architectural work. And we need that to communicate with other people. I mean, otherwise we communicate an architecture which came out of thin air basically. And here we can say, yeah, we would like to make or we recommend this solution because it has these advantages and here are the trade-offs while the other one had that advantage and these trade-offs. But we think this one is better in our, is better than the other one and so on. And yeah, and again, we have to talk to very different stakeholder groups here. But even then I say, yeah, you're great. You're doing great. But I think one more thing is missing and I think that's the most important one. I think and think and think and say, well, we give up. Said, yeah, well, it's about examine, understanding the problem. I mean, that's what it all starts with. So understand the problem, the context, understand, examine the problem space holistically. So look at the functionality that the solution needs to implement, at the quality attributes, at time and cost constraints, at the risks, at other constraints, political constraints, organizational constraints, legal constraints, all that stuff that we need to understand before we even can start to think about an architecture for the solution. I mean, I'm still surprised how often I see people out there who come up with complete architectures before the first requirement was is known. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite odd. just since two years ago, three years ago, I had that where I said, "Yeah, well, what's this problem about? So, what's the what's the whole project about?" And we don't know, but here's the architecture for that because that's how we do applications right now. Here's Microsoft and Kubernetes and we are doing, of course, an SPA on the other side and we need a new SQL, no SQL database. So, uh, again, what's the problem? Uh, we don't know yet, but we know how the solution will look like. And wow, I don't think that's a good idea. So understanding the problem especially also functionality. That's the basis of all the other activities because here we get the focus, the context that we need to make decisions, to find options, to evaluate options in our context. Is the monolith or the microservice the better idea or is something in between the better idea? Do we need a single paid application or can we simply um, do server-side rendering for normal web application? Do we need a native app or is some hybrid app or just a responsive um, web application sufficient? And, 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 and all these decisions. So we need that to explore our solution space and to evaluate the options in our context and of course to communicate stuff. So that's very, very important. And if I don't do that, most architectures are just personal opinions. So I can't communicate why this one's better than the other one and so on. Still see that very often. So to complete the picture here then, four core activities. Examine, understand the problem, explore, find possible solution options, evaluate, find their trade-offs, their pros and cons, and execute, help all the other stakeholder groups to make the best decisions possible in their given context. And that's what architectural work, at least for me, is about. Now, because there's some kind of causal dependency that say, yeah, well, um, okay, you need to examine first, understand the problem first before you can find solution options. And before you have solution options, you cannot evaluate them. Before you haven't evaluated solution options, you can't communicate them. 
are you trying us to sell are you trying to sell off some kind of beat of some big design up front a waterfallish like no 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 so yeah there's some kind of causal dependency but i wouldn't recommend to do one completely always before starting the other one so when to do what and how much that's a different story again and so that's what i would like to talk about in the remaining 10 minutes and if I talk about what to do and how much to do, I always start with discussing uncertainty. Discussing uncertainty would be a big topic. Uh, we could talk about that for probably a whole day, but I try to keep it short here. I mean, if you act under uncertainty, that means that you cannot predict the value of what you're doing. So, I mean, the core assumption usually is here's a requirement and if you implement that it creates value so output output equals outcome under uncertainty you don't know that a requirement can create value it can be a value adding activity but it can also be an idle activity or even a value reducing activity you only know under after the fact so you have to implement this and see the response of the users to understand if it added value or not, or even annoyed the users. And that's a very different situation if you have this kind of un uncertainty and most process models do not take that into account. So under uncertainty, you do not maximize value by optimizing efficiency of your efforts, but by detecting and cutting idle and value reducing performances as soon as possible. So try to figure out as soon as possible, is what I'm doing here creating value or not? And before looking at how to do that, let's first see for a second, um, do we have uncertainty in our IT project these days? Um, and my point of view is yes, tons of that. I mean, we have post-industrial markets uh, and also startup markets where post-industrial markets are markets where supply is a lot bigger than demand. And then this means that customers do not need to buy your product. They will only buy your solution, your product and use that if it really fits their personal needs best. Otherwise, they go to the competitors. So you can create something and um, well, um, can create value or it doesn't and doing market research only brings you that far if you ask people now um, do you like that and they say yes or no um, that's a very different story from um, from 12 months from now so when you are going to release the solution then or something like that so also digital transformation um, which means that Basically, that IT became an integral part not only of processes and user interactions, but also, meanwhile, shapes new business, uh, business offerings or even starts to change markets. Um, you can look around and most companies are not prepared for that. So a lot of uncertainty. So they don't know how people respond to that and um, how that will affect them and so on. So we could talk about that also for an hour, but I run out of time. Disruptive technologies, the <clears throat> many companies have a hard time to understand how to use that and how to apply that to their business situations and how to take advantage of that and the complexity of all the context and tasks. So if you go to um, here um, to Dave Snowden and um, his concepts when he distinguishes between complicated and complex tasks. That's very interesting and enlightening, basically. So insightful. And um, there's a lot more things. So we have a lot of uncertainty in IT. And if I try to act under uncertainty, basically, I usually try to create a hypothesis so I don't go on and say, Here's a requirement, do that, it will create value. But I say, oh, I think that is a good idea. And if it really is a good idea, it will have the following effect. And then I do the smallest suitable action to measure the effect. So I try to cut that into a small question. And then I implement that, send that out, measure the effect and evaluate the hypothesis. And if it works, I go on. If it doesn't work, um, maybe I try to pivot or ask a question differently and or I even drop it. So and. That's a very different way than just implementing a backlog, which leads to different value maximization approaches. 
going from certain to uncertainty. The more certainty I have, the more I can going for maximizing efficiency, planning and detail controlling and so on. And on the other hand, um, the more uncertainty I have, the more I go for hypothesis validation, small steps, quick, feed, quick feedback cycles and so on. And I can use that to have different kinds of software development approaches which starts here with a focus on cost where let's say a legal new legal requirement or something like that um, there is no uncertainty involved i have to implement that i have to know what to do maybe i have not done my work homework um, that um, i don't know where to implement that but it has nothing to do with uncertainty and here we have waterfall remodel and safe and so on yeah i know that safe has some agile in its name but uh, basically uh, it's not um, we can discuss that at a different time um, then we have this kind of um, enterprise agile for a little bit of um, uncertainty, basically. So it's not a lot of uh, um, uncertainty that we usually tackle with the typical Scrum implementations and so on. Um, just if you ask yourself, wow, but we are so agile. If your lead times from an idea until the customer sees the result is longer than two weeks as a rule of thumb, you're not agile. Um, it, it can still have a lot of value what you're doing. So I'm not saying you're doing it wrong, but I wouldn't say that it's really agile because agile is about learning along the way about quick learning loops. And unless you implement them, you're not really agile. So the most agile implementations I see in companies solve a different problem. That's why I have them over here. So if you have more uncertainty, you're more going for flow-based approaches. So optimizing for lead times, basically, and trying to learn without compromising quality. Then over here, if you have even more uncertainty, you really have to explore the solution space first. You're also willing to compromise the quality uh, in some ways. And um, so that's more core focus on feedback. And finally, um, if you have no idea what to start with, you first have to figure out where you want to start exploring. And that's usually where software development is not yet involved. And you can use that certainty to uncertainty access also to arrange the architectural work. We are saying a cost-based approach. A BDAF, big design upfront is perfectly fine. I mean, Design the stuff, implement it, test it, and so on, and release it. Um, optimize for cost. That's that's cool um, in this context, but only if there's no uncertainty involved. If you really know what's needed. If there's some uncertainty, yeah. So in the first one, the cost base, usually that design part is we talk about weeks usually. In the agile context, we do a decent design upfront and occasional updates. So usually in these contexts, we talk about days of figuring out the uh, architecture and we rarely revisit that along the implementation. In the flow-based approach, we go with just enough design upfront, continuous evolution. So we talk about a day or maybe maximum two then to come up with an initial, understand enough to come up with an initial architecture and then move on and while we're learning along the way, we try to improve that continuously. Here, we just figure out something which helps us to work fast um, and we don't care about architecture too much because I mean, 99, 90, uh, nine out of 10 times, we will throw away the code anyway. And so, but that's not an approach which is suitable for systems and maintenance. And you are not talking about architecture at all. Okay. There are some more drivers, which I will not discuss right now because I'm running out of time, um, which can affect how much architectural work we're doing when. Let me try to wrap up now. So what did I talk about? I did talk about the why of architectural work. Minimize cumulative costs without violating correctness. I talked about how of architectural work. For e model, understand the problem, find solution options, evaluate their trade offs, and help the different stakeholder groups to make the best decisions possible. When to do architectural work and how much? Line things with uncertainty. So either do a lot up front or do it along the way, depending on the amount of uncertainty that you have in your task. 
And maybe one core message in here is there's no one size fits all. It's not the right way to do architectural work. Do what it's needed and stay away from the fashions. They usually lead you the wrong way. And please remember, do not forget the humans in the game. That's what I had for you. Thanks a lot. And now I'm ready for your questions. Hi, thank you so much for your session. Let's go ahead. We have a couple of questions right off the bat. The first question, do you have any tips on how to collaborate effectively with all of the different stakeholder groups? <laughs> well, that's a little bit of a challenge, basically. I mean, it, it doesn't start out of thin air. I mean, you need to have some kind of curiosity. You must be curious to see what are the people are doing over there in the business department? What are these finance guys always talking about? What are these marketing people doing? What is the manager? What, what does this language mean and so on? And be open and try to get into a discussion with them. And um, you will get a lot of bloody noses. My nose, you, if it really would show the bloody nose, my nose would be completely flat. Um, um, because of all the walls I ran to ran into over my career, um, but but it's basically this way. You you will always have this scarcity management because when you would love to implement architectural building blocks in your solution, which is also a cool thing if you do that. That's also the point in time when you have to do the most discussions with the other stakeholder groups. So you're always torn between. At least that's what my problem is. Should I code now or should I talk now? And ah, so it will be always a hard thing, I think. <laughs> but start with the curiosity. Absolutely. I think that's a great um, piece of advice. Thank you for that answer. The next question we have, and the final one at the moment, is can you give us some insight on the evaluate part of architectures? How do you go about or sorry, elevating <laughs> the elevate part of architectures. How do you go about elevating architectures? Evaluation is, um, I mean, there are whole books written about that. Um, some by the people from the, um, or the, the Bass and Co. Um, from Software Engineering Institute. If you are an English speaking person, if you're a German speaking person, also um, Stefan Todt um, wrote a book about that, how to evaluate architectures. Um, basically, the, the core idea most of the concepts have is say, let's come up with some scenarios where you say, okay, um, here are things. So take your stakeholders and say, so what do you think is going to happen in the future? And then you create some scenarios and then you take the different options and match them against the scenarios and say, how well do they support these scenarios? And that helps you to find um, some kind of an evaluation. There are quite big approaches like Atom, the architecture trade of analysis methods, and there are more fine grained methods, which are also easier applicable in agile or more flow like context and so on, which just take a few hours or something like that. But going into depth, that would be a longer story. Hope I gave at least some starting point. I believe so. Um, well, at the moment, we don't have any further questions. So I'd like to thank you again for your session and for the great answers on a couple of questions we had. Uh, I hope you can stick around for the remainder of the conference as well. And it actually looks like we have one additional. If you have some time, I'd love to put it up on the screen for you. All right. Okay, so the question says, how formal do you think requirements should be captured? Any advice? Well, <laughs> that's a great question. And okay, now the consultant in me would say it depends. And um, yeah, I mean, basically, at least if you're acting under uncertainty, which most of the projects I'm living in, um, do. I say every requirement is a bet against the market. And if you think about bets, um, 
you know there's a probability that you will lose the bet. So just good enough. So good enough to know what to do, but not any better. And what I find very important and which very often missed in my point of view is how do I know that I won the bet? So um, how do I know that this was a good idea? Because I, of, I often, um, I pre personally, I prefer the hypothesis-driven development, at least in these kinds of contexts where I'm <clears throat> going to, um, where uh, I always say, yeah, well, I think this is a good idea, but I do not know yet. And so usually I say yeah, semi-formal, basically. Um, <clears throat> also leaving some room for refinement. Now, there are some additional constraints which can change that. I mean, if the requester and the implementer never talk to each other, uh, there are many organizations where they, it's almost impossible for them to talk to each other, you need more formality. If legal constraints uh, side with that. So if you get that wrong that you have to pay a high fine or something like that, yeah, well, then you have to go more formal. If human lives are involved, which also gives you usually um, um, harder legal requirements, um, then probably you need to be more formal. But usually in the kind of projects where I'm in, that nobody really, no, no lives get harmed and where we try to rather find the best solution possible for the users and um, not just sticking to a straight, a straight plan. I say, yeah, well, just as formal as necessary and as formal as, as informal as possible. And most important of all, think about the question, how do I know that this was a successful requirement? Hope that helps a bit. <laughs> I would assume so. There's an, one last question that we have time for right now. Let's put it up on screen. What do you use in examine, uh, in the examine part, DDD, for example? Um, there are a lot of things that um, I tend to use over there. Let's go over here and see just something, the examine part. Mm, I'm just in the wrong, pla wrong part here. Mm. Usually um, in that context, um, I use a lot of different techniques. DDD is a good technique in some cases. Um, also techniques like event storming, if you're able to gather all the different kinds of stakeholder groups. I mean, event storming, the big secret of event storming is not so much the output, but getting different stakeholder groups talking to each other and agreeing about a solution, um, which is worth a lot in many con in many projects, actually. Um, I also have different formats, like for instance, um, what, I, what I'm often doing is simply saying, well, um, just two things here. Um, so here's a black box, that's our solution. So first let's figure out who's interacting with that solution, which people and which other systems. And usually it's the first big surprise, um, so it's, traditional context diagram, basically. Um, and uh, because people usually come and say, yeah, well, it's a quite simple solution. And they say, oh, well, that, that 20 part is talking to that system. Say, oh, whoops, it's, maybe it's not that simple. Okay, and I say, okay, we've learned that one. Now let's figure out the core use cases for all them. What do they need to know? And then you already have a lot, know a lot about the behavior and say, okay, can we group these kind of use cases? And we for, have a first arrangement of um, modules of components of the system, maybe um, maybe, maybe even different services, um, maybe even um, different kinds of services that we want to implement and so on. And um, that's usually, something which takes two or three hours often just, or maybe half a day or something like that. And we already learned a lot about the system. And also with the quality attributes, I usually prearrange them and say, okay, here are the most 10 most important quality attributes that I think that are relevant for your context. So go all up to the whiteboard and 
bring them in an order. So what's the most important one, the least important one? And, and there are no, no equal ones because then otherwise every, everyone would be on the same level and it would be highest priority. So bring them in an order. And um, so from one to 10, and there's also a lot of stuff which is very surprising basically and um, so and so there are a lot of different techniques i also try to understand what what level of uncertainty do we have um because so how well do you know the solution and how how well do you know already how your customers act and did you do, do that before a lot of different questions because then i know how to move on with the architectural work and again a lot more things but um also ddd can be useful but it's not the only so it's not a magic weapon it's one useful weapon but find different things to put in your toolbox and try them out you will be surprised often great well thank you i hope i hope that answers the question for for our viewer um i'd like to say thank you again for your session and okay. let's go on to our, our break time and get ready for the next talk yeah. Thanks. Have a great day. Thanks. We'll stick around. <laughs> <laughs>